And so as we look at this, here's what I see. One, as I said, we're at war. We've been at war for eight years. We're engaged uh, with a global extremist terrorist network that attacked us on our soil. They're not going to quit. They're not going to give up. And they're not going to go away. They are going to have to be defeated. But this is a long-term ideological struggle that's not going to be one with military means alone. So it's a, it's a long-term proposition. And against that backdrop, we look at trends, emerging trends that we see in the global environment. Uh, things like globalization. I mean, up until a year or so ago, globalization was spreading prosperity around the world. But even then, it was unevenly distributing it. And there were have and have not countries. And the populations of those have not countries are much more susceptible to recruiting by these terrorist networks. Technology, another double-edged double sword. The same technology that's bringing knowledge to anyone with a computer is being used by terrorists to export terror around the globe. Demographics, also going in the wrong direction. I mean, we've seen studies that say that the populations of some developing countries, like Pakistan, for example, will double over the, in population size over the next decade. I mean, can you, can you imagine the problems that brings to already stretched governments? And, and then the population is increasingly moving to cities. Again, studies have, have shown us that by 2030, expectations are that 60% of the population of the, of the world are going to live in cities. And, and, and some of us have been in, in the slums of Sadr City in Baghdad. It's a three by five mile square area where two million people live. And there's a lot of those places around the world. And the other is interesting thing about demographics is the demand that it puts on resources. The middle classes in both India and China are already larger than the population of the United States. That's a lot of two-car families, but with the attendant pressure on the resources. And the two things that worry me most are safe havens, and weapons of mass destruction in the hands of terrorist organizations. And by safe havens, I mean countries or parts of countries where the local government can't or won't deny their country to terrorist organizations, much like we had in Afghanistan before September 11th. And weapons of mass destruction, we know the terrorist organizations are out there seeking, actively seeking weapons of mass destruction. And I firmly believe that when they get one, they will attempt to employ it against a developed country. And so that's the reality that we're dealing with. And when you put all that together, the fact we're at war and we see those trends, then I believe that we are in for a decade or so of what I call persistent conflict. Protracted confrontation among states, non-states, and individual actors that are increasingly willing to use violence to accomplish their political and ideological objectives. Uh, that's what I think we, that's what we are preparing ourselves for as an army. Now, it's, it's not enough for us to say that's what the broad environment looks like to build an army. We have to ask ourselves, what does war look like? What's the character of conflict? And I will tell you, as we've looked at this, the character of conflict that we're facing now in Iraq and Afghanistan and will continue to face for the rest of this decade is a heck of a lot different than it was the conflicts that I grew up training to fight large tank battles on the plains of Europe or in the deserts of, of Saudi Arabia. And some, surely we're seeing some of the future in Iraq and Afghanistan. There's no question about that. Uh, but I prefer to look at what happened in, in southern Lebanon in the summer of 2006 as a better indication of what we're likely to face. Because what you had in southern Lebanon was a terrorist organization, Hezbollah, a non-state actor, operating inside a state, Lebanon, supported by two other states, Syria and Iran, and fighting yet another state, Israel. And that non-state actor had the instruments of state power provided by the two, those other two states. They, they started the war with 13,000 rockets, and not just the small rockets they shoot at our bases, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but the large rockets that they shot at Israeli population centers. They used improvised explosive devices to channelize the attacking Israeli armored forces 
into ambush sites where they fired them at them with state-of-the-art anti-tank guided missiles that they got from Iran. Forty percent of the Israeli casualties came from these anti-tank guided missiles. They shot down an Israeli helicopter with a state-of-the-art surface-to-air missile. They hit an Israeli ship in the Mediterranean Sea with a cruise missile. They used unmanned aerial vehicles to target the Israelis. They used secure cell phones to communicate and, and secure computers to, for command and control. And they got the word out on local television. Now that's, that's a fundamentally different kind of fight and a different kind of enemy than, than I grew up having to face. And, and so we have been working really since September 11th, but, but more, more since 2004, to move ourselves away from the Cold War Army we were designed to be to an army that is much more relevant in dealing with those challenges that I just described to you. And, and, I, and we have made great progress. We, we were a, a really good army uh, on September 11th. But we were designed to do something fundamentally different than we're doing today. And we have adapted ourselves on the fly because every year we're deploying or redeploying 150,000 soldiers over and back from Iraq to Afghanistan. But at the same time, uh, we have made significant change uh, to shed some of those Cold War capabilities and build capabilities that we need in the current operations, for example, civil affairs, psychological operations, military police, engineers. And so we're, we're, we have about another year or so uh, before we finish that up. But it, by 11, 2011, it will be a fundamentally different army than it was in 2011, and one far more suited to deal with the challenges uh, that we're facing around the world today and will continue to face in the future. Now, uh, I'd like to close just by uh, talking about giving you a story here to talk about the quality of men and women uh, in their armed forces. Uh, we designated this year as the year of the non-commissioned officers. Now, how many f serving or former non-commissioned officers are there in this audience? Would you stand up, please? Current and, and former. There you go. Uh, this is the first time in 20 years that, that we have designated a year as the year of the non-commissioned officers. We did it uh, 20 years ago. Uh, General Vono did it, in fact, that Don and I worked for, because we were, at that time, just coming out of rebuilding the non-commissioned officer corps after Vietnam. And what we saw this year, we thought, was almost as seminal, because what we found is the, the professionalism of our non-commissioned officers is such that they are the glue that's been holding this force together in these incredibly difficult and challenging times. And so we wanted everyone to understand, one, to recognize uh, what they provide, not only to the armed forces, but to this country. Because believe me, they are a national asset. And every time I have a meeting with one of my foreign counterparts, I say, what can I do for you? What do you need? They say, I want non-commissioned officers like yours. I say, can't have them. So uh, the non-commissioned officers we just recognized are just uh, a, a small portion of the magnificent force that we have. And again, they're the glue that's holding this force together. One of those non-commissioned officers was, was recognized in September with the Congressional Medal of Honor. And Sergeant First Class Jared Monte uh, was a squad leader leading a 16-man patrol uh, in Afghanistan in June of 2006. And that patrol was surrounded and attacked uh, by a, 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 a Taliban force that outnumbered them by about four to one. 